222 is a story about a couple who have to fight, fight, fight to have a malevolent spirit removed from their family home. One of the good things about the Lyric Theatre is it's one of the few West End venues where you can't hear the sound of the underground. There are several moments in this play that make you jump. Something kind of too jumping on my two two. It's twos. Oh my god, hey, welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello, my name is Mickey Joe. I am obsessed with all things theatre and I am an independent freelance theatre critic based here in the UK, as well as a content creator on YouTube. I make videos all about the theatre and I generally review stuff that I have been invited to go and see. So tonight I was thrilled to be invited to return to the play 222, A Ghost Story. This has been haunting various different West End venues since just after the pandemic. It first appeared at the Noel Coward Theatre while Dear Evan Hansen was waiting to fully reopen and it subsequently played at the Gielgud Theatre, the Criterion, and it is now at the Lyric Theatre on Shaftesbury Avenue. As well as its admirable longevity, this spooky play has become synonymous with a certain amount of celebrity casting. The original production featured EastEnders star Jake Wood and music icon Lily Allen, who was nominated for an Olivier Award for her performance. Subsequent stars of the production have included Giovanna Fletcher, Stephanie Beatrice, James Buckley from The Inbetweeners, Love Island's Laura Whitmore, Matt Willis, Tom Felton from the Harry Potter movies. Like, lots of people have been in this play. And the current cast is no exception because it features not only the stage debut, but the acting debut of former Girls Aloud band member and pop star in her own right, Cheryl, formerly Cheryl Cole, formerly Cheryl Tweedy, now simply Cheryl. Like Cher, but with extra letters. And needless to say, this is a very talked about debut and people really don't know what to expect because there is admittedly a lack of experience on her part in terms of acting. Um, so people are very intrigued to see what her performance is like in 222. There has even been a joke added to the script of My Sons Are Queer, but what can you do referencing Cheryl making her stage debut in this play? So I am here today to tell you not only what I thought of this play, but also how good Cheryl was in it. Did it work? Can she act? We are going to answer all of these questions in today's video. But before I do, if you enjoy today's video, make sure to subscribe to my stagey YouTube channel. I make video content like this all the time. I post super regularly, reviews of stuff that I've seen, videos talking about news and drama in the theatre world. If that sounds like something you would be interested in seeing more of here on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. And if you want to see it before everyone else with some exclusive content thrown in, make sure you sign up for £2.99 a month to be one of my YouTube members. There is a link in the description. Or I'll haunt you. Maybe. Probably not. Now, let's talk about Cheryl in 222. Ooh. Okay, so before we talk about Cheryl, let me just tell you about the play. When I first saw this at the Noel Coward Theatre, I believe I gave it a four-star review. If you want to watch my original video on that, you can find it somewhere here on my channel. It was a while ago. And I didn't know if I was going to enjoy it as much this evening, because it's really not the horror that it markets itself as. It is more of a psychological thriller. And as with many psychological thrillers, it has a twist. I'm not going to spoil anything about the plot in today's video, do not worry, but there are things that are revealed about it that will change your perspective when you see it for the second time, because you already know a certain amount of what is going to come. So I was uncertain. I thought, am I going to enjoy this as much when there's nothing for me to be working out? But there are enough details and breadcrumbs that you can enjoy uh, throughout the early parts of the play that you will now pick up on knowing where it's going to end up. So that I did find very interesting and I still enjoyed it very much. I thought it was very cleverly written uh, and I was able to enjoy all of the details in the script. I don't think it's as inherently theatrically staged as something like The Woman in Black, which is just a really impressive naturally theatrical staging, but I do still think that it's it's a fun thriller and still a four-star review from me. I think it's structured very well. I think the pacing is really good where it could start to drag. It doesn't. I don't think it's particularly scary, but then that probably broadens the audience to which it can appeal. I say that as someone who would not readily book tickets to something that is super, super scary. I would much rather 
rather something that is smart and that you can read into and try and work stuff out. It's sort of the modern theatrical answer to an Agatha Christie. It's not a whodunit and it's not quite as layered and charming as an Agatha Christie, but it has that same kind of vibe about it. It's something for you to solve as you are watching. Not only that, there's a little bit of commentary in it as well. There is talk about religious differences and and class disparity and what's the thing where rich people buy old houses? Gentrification, gentrification. There's a lot of talk about gentrification and all of that arises naturally. It's really convincingly written dialogue. You understand who all of these people are. They all feel convincing and compelling. You understand their relationships to each other. It all feels very real. And I think it's important that it does in this kind of a play. So let's talk about Cheryl. Now, there have certainly been naysayers. Since she was announced, people were dubious about how she would perform in this play. And I'm here to tell you that perhaps surprisingly, she does a really great job. I would say she acquitted herself very well this evening. And let's be completely honest, it is not Ibsen, it is not Shakespeare, it is not even the most challenging dramatic role within this quartet of performers, which is why it is probably the role of the four that has been the most commonly, we would say, stunt cast in the theatre, which is where you're casting a celebrity name rather than a trained thespian. But to give her all the credit, I think she does a really great job. It's a wonderful debut from Cheryl here. She has considerable charm and she does exactly what she needs to, which is to feel realistic and naturalistic because that's the nature of the play. That's the tone with which this has been directed. It's not grandiose. It's not enormously passionate and dramatic and overtly theatrical. She just has to feel real and she does. Her relationships to the other characters on stage feel realistic. She has a good rapport while she is feuding with the actor who is playing her husband, but you also buy into her hysteria. Now, without telling you too much about the plot, you find out very early on that she is the character who believes she has experienced a ghost. And as the main witness to this, trying to convince everyone around her, she is always positioned within the narrative to have to be fairly hysterical throughout. So it's the challenge for anyone playing this role to find other shades within that. Moments where she can achieve calmness while she is still in a very frenzied state, which she is for much of the play. And I appreciated that she did that. I thought she was perhaps a little too muted at the beginning. I thought carrying on through the first act, maybe a little too cold and a little too indifferent towards her husband's character because we're meant to see tension growing there. And I think if we start in a place of too much tension, we don't have anywhere to go. And we do still want to see the warmth between them, which we maybe lacked a little bit of. But where I really enjoyed her was in the second act where she was able to interact with other characters and show softer sides to herself. And there was a particular scene where they are quizzing each other about the possibility of ghosts existing. And the way she played that I thought was really charming and brought out a lovely side to her character, very different to all of the hysterical stuff that had been happening before. And she played it with such confidence and authority. It felt nothing like a total acting debut. I was really genuinely very impressed by that. And again, not the most challenging role in the world, but she does have these passionate moments. She does have a few of these outbursts and she plays those very very believably. Maybe we need a little bit more in the final moments of the play, but I'm not going to tell you what it's about, so I'll have to let you go and see it and decide for yourself. If anyone is watching this video purely for more details about her performance, uh, her body language is very believable, the way she's carrying herself. One of my favourite things about her performance and watching her on stage is the way she reacts to everyone else. There are various moments where other people are just telling her stories from their past that become these extended monologues, and she is is transfixed and heartbreakingly emotionally engaged with this storytelling. She is so desperate to hear what they are saying and have it confirm what she believes to be true. And if anyone wants even more details about her performance in this play and has no idea what it's about, she does not sing, she uses her normal accent, and I have no idea if she signs at the stage door. <laughs> 
Now let's talk about some of the rest of the cast. So I particularly want to talk about Jake Wood. He was part of the original cast of this play back at the Noel Coward. He won the What's On Stage Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Male Identifying Role in a Play. I thought he was tremendous back then. And I really enjoyed him again this evening. Having seen the play once in between with a different actor, I think Jake Wood is actually a deceptively valuable component to this because you could look at the plot of the show and feel as though he is the character out of the four of them that is the least integral to it. However, he provides a lot of comic relief in the first act that prevents it becoming unbearably tense because otherwise with everything that's going on, they're trying to build and build this tension. You need a source of relief. You need someone who is going to ease that tension and let us all off the hook. Otherwise, we're just going to get so, 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 so tense that it becomes uncomfortable to endure, unrelentingly tense. And that is not a fun theatrical experience for anyone. So Jake Wood being as funny as he is, as relatable as he is, and being able to get a laugh so easily with his little asides because his characterization is so spot on. And again, something very in his wheelhouse, not the biggest stretch in the world, but he does a really great job of it. That is a very important piece of the puzzle that makes up a really great cast of this show. He was not meant to be part of this cast, but he is returning to the role after the previously cast actor had to withdraw. The rest of the cast is completed by Louise Ford and Scott Karim. I enjoy both of them in these roles. Louise Ford in particular plays a character who drinks a lot over the course of the one evening over which the play takes place and I thought she played very believably drunk. This is a difficult thing to get convincingly right because people can very easily go over the top when they're playing a drunk character and this is so naturalistic that has to feel very real and it does it does feel real but also i think she characterizes it in a slightly more enjoyable way because she plays a fun drunk rather than a sad or a messy drunk which is where i've seen this character go before and that also worked in its own ways and she has moments of sorrow and she has moments of reflection and she gets introspective and wallows a little bit but I think she makes some really fun physical choices while everything is spiraling into tension around her that allow us to, again, just have a little bit of a laugh and a little bit of relief because she has no concept of how serious everything's getting and she's lying on the sofa and waving her foot in a funny way that, that you do when you're drunk. You do these strange things and you become transfixed by your own hands, that sort of stuff. Not that I've ever drunk in my life, so I have no idea. Scott Grimm as Sam, meanwhile, he gets one side of his personality down very well, which is this arrogant, lecturing uh, character. I wish that he could also be a little bit more charming and a little bit more endearing, because you run the risk with his character of him just feeling completely obnoxious, and you have to understand why Cheryl's character, who is his wife, still has this affection for him. You have to buy into their relationship. That's a really important part of this play. So even though they are feuding and they're tense and they're experiencing this difficulty in communicating, you have to want them to be able to work through that. And for that to happen, he has to not be quite so awful. It's a very difficult tightrope to walk across but I think just tipped slightly onto the side of too arrogant for me. So I do want to issue something of a disclaimer for anyone who is nervous about seeing this play. I do not enjoy scary stuff. I don't like things that will make me jump. Right at the beginning of this play, you have this scream sound effect and a blackout and a red light that appears around the border of the proscenium, and that happens a few times. Outside of that, nothing explicitly really scary happens within the show. It is all about this scream sound effect that they keep bringing back in order to run scene changes. I think when I first reviewed this, I thought that that was kind of a cheap gimmick, and now I don't mind that it gives people in the auditorium the chance to just check in with each other while some music plays and ask if anyone's worked it out yet or share theories. I think that's, you know, that's fun. It's somewhere between watching TV at home that makes you really think and try and work out what the twist is and seeing something in a theater. I don't think we necessarily have to sit in complete silence, but if you don't want to be as part of an audience that sounds like that, then maybe this is not the play for you. I do also think that watching it as someone who had seen it before, I was able to enjoy not only the details in the script and how cleverly all of the clues had been scattered into the early parts of 
the plot and the first act, but also just the components of a show like this in putting a ghost story on stage with something like this, with a thriller, I'm always going to ask the question of why is this being theatricalized? Why for the stage and why not for TV or for film? And I think it's really impressive to be able to convincingly deliver something that is completely naturalistic, that feels like a believable glimpse into a real world. And so I have to shout out the creatives, the direction, the way that the tone ebbed and flowed was really great tonight. I thought that was really well done. We laugh in all the right places. It gets a little bit heavier, but it never feels oppressive, which I appreciate. And that's Matthew Dunster directing, and the play itself is written by Danny Robbins. I also want to talk about Chris Fisher, who is credited for Illusions. It's not a magical play like the Harry Potter one, but there are moments that are very impressive. Again, the whole thing has to feel completely real, and you have to believe what you are seeing. It's not like people walking on in wizard cloaks and carrying things around. It's not that style of magic. It has to be believable. And it is. Also, Anna Fleischel's set design. I appreciate it every time I see it. I love a realistic set. I love to see walls. Uh, this one even has a skylight. Even the play skylight does not actually have a skylight in it. They just they just talk about the skylight. But that's a, a niche theatrical reference for those of you that have seen the play skylight. In any case, I like the set. It's a lovely set. I feel like if you are going to use one static set for the entirety of your play, it needs to look as good as this one. And they talk a lot about this house that they are renovating, and you can see all of the details in that. Your eyes can be very, very busy. You needn't look at the performers for any of the play. Not that you wouldn't want to, but there is enough to look at in the details of the set that if for some reason you didn't want to, you wouldn't have to. But those have been my thoughts on 222, A Ghost Story. If you want to hear more about what I have to say about this play, you can go and watch my original review of it back on YouTube. But for this new cast in the same production, I thought they did a great job. A couple of issues here and there, but broadly, one of my favorite casts to have seen in this show. I thought Cheryl was fantastic and deserves a lot of success for this, her West End debut. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my Stagey YouTube channel for plenty more content coming very soon, including reviews of many more shows. If you have been lucky enough to see 222 already, either with a previous cast or with this brand new cast at the Lyric Theatre, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. What did you think about Cheryl in this role? What do you think about the play? But let's avoid spoilers in the comments section for people who haven't seen it yet. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>